Vicky Lenane and welcome to Embrace Therapy Podcast. I am a practicing art therapist based in Ireland. In each episode, I will interview guests from various fields of therapy and well-being with the aim to encourage healing through embracing therapy. Joining me today is Katie O'Donoghue. Katie is originally from County Kerry in Ireland. She's an author, an illustrator, an art psychotherapist, and currently studying a PhD in critical heritage and well-being. And as a result of the pandemic, Katie took her pen to paper and she decided to write this book that we'll talk about today, The Little Squirrel Who Worried. It is a book aimed at helping children cope with inner worries and anxieties. I hope you enjoy this episode. I really enjoyed having a chat with Katie. Okay, so Katie, Katie O'Donoghue, our therapist and new author. Um, <laughs> so excited to have you on. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming on to the podcast today. I'm delighted to be here, Vicky. Thanks for having me. That's so exciting. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Katie has this beautiful book that's come out into to the shops. Um, well, it's it's coming out into the shops. Is Actually, it? has a uh, launch date was July 23rd, so it is in the shops now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Available Amazing. online and in stores in Ireland, and I think um, international customers can get it through Book Depository. I think if I'm right. Fantastic. Okay. And Amazon. Amazon. Yes. Yeah. That is wonderful. <laughs> Thank that you. That is so good because this book is, it's just come out at the right time. Um, and I think for anybody who is in the caring profession or mental health profession, I think it's it's a perfect book for, for their clients. But also as parents, I think it's a really good book. So the, the little squirrel who worried. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about the book. Okay. So, um, the inspiration for the book really started last year. Um, I At the time, I was working in the UK and I was working for the NHS CAMS. Um, and so I was working with children and young people. And one of the, I suppose, uh, therapeutic interventions I was facilitating was a group for parents. And it was um, an eight-week course, uh, myself and another facilitator, in which we... Um, sort of gave parents um, psychoeducation around what anxiety is, um, different sort of coping skills, um, strategies to help their child, really to help them gain an understanding and a way of helping them to respond to maybe, rather than just reassurance, ways of empowering the children to sort of find their own solutions, which would also then assist in lowering their anxiety because they weren't... um, depending on answers from elsewhere, I guess. Mm. Um, and it was a really successful group. Um, the parents that attended were were amazing. And it was lovely to hear the stories after each week when they felt it was a, that they could use some of those skills and their learning and then they'd come back and there were big smiles on their faces and tell me about the wonderful week they had or a moment where they just felt, yes, <laughs> I got this <laughs> as a parent. You know, it was really lovely. So um, October last year, uh, I think we were into the second lockdown and I was, I suppose I was missing home myself, hadn't seen family for a while, missing Ireland. And I began illustrating, I guess, I was drawing and painting really. I, you know, I just, these little um, native Irish characters, mainly the first one being the little red squirrel. And I was like, I was drawing these different scenes and I just thought, oh, I could do something with this. And I thought, why don't I make up a story that uses some of the coping techniques and learning that I've been facilitating on this course? So I put it to put it together, uh, illustrations along with a bit of a manuscript. And I was sending it to my uh, father over in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is a bit of a long story, but I do have a point. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, I... So I emailed it off, but it was a Thursday night and it was late and I was tired. So I'd, I'd had a busy day at work and um, I just checked my sent box and make sure it had gone. And I realized it had gone to the wrong email address. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, sure, we've all done that at some point, haven't we? Yes. And I just thought, look, oh, no, but probably be grand. Um, you know, it's only for my own enjoyment. I'm doing this anyway. 
Anyway, next morning, half six, I get, I see that there's an email in my inbox. So I open it and it's from a different uh, Brian. Brian is my father's name. Um, and he says to me, hi, Katie, I'm pretty sure this wasn't meant for me, but I couldn't help but be curious and open it up. <laughs> Turns out he printed off the story and Brian has a six-year-old son called Henry and Brian and Henry live in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, wow. And Brian shared with me that uh, Henry had been seeing a therapist because Henry has anxiety. Yeah. He read the story to Henry. Henry um, sort of recapped and refreshed on some of the techniques he had learned in the past. And then going to bed, he said to his dad, that was a really good bedtime story. And Brian said, he never says that about stories. So when you're published, please let us know. We'd love to buy some copies. Oh, I just got goosebumps. I know. It was um, such a, I don't know, the, the kindness as well and the care that he actually bothered to email me to let me know um, was such validation. And like I have to say, kind of ser serendipity as well. You couldn't really make it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, you know, what? like that is yeah. just powerful. Like, it was lovely. Curiosity from him. Yeah. Uh, as well which was so beautiful for him to just mm -hmm. print it off as well and just yeah. oh that's so gorgeous isn't it so it pushed me to go well look if this little boy enjoyed it my god well why don't I just submit it to publishers and see what harm will it do to me anyway you know and so yeah here's and here we are the that book got published <laughs> That is just magic. What beautiful, like serendipity is just the perfect word. Mm. Gosh. So, you know, this kind of was just coming organically to you, this character, the squirrel. And, you know, you've already been doing the work and you had mm. the, the, the skills of how to build resilience in kids and yeah. their family mm. around the area of anxiety. Yeah. And, and the story seems to very much stem from a lovely metaphor of the squirrel leaving the nest mm -hmm. like us leaving the house in lockdown yeah, yeah. So I that's what I'm saying is that like it just seems like the perfect time and it just came in such a lovely manner Um, it's beautiful Katie thank you no and it, and it's one of those things that I to be honest like I wrote and drew had most of I'd say 80 percent of the illustrations done and sent I did it in around two and a half weeks which is a bit mad, <laughs> but it was just like a process. And like, as a, this was a, a creative art therapist yourself, it's like when you, sometimes they can be all consuming in a way, in a wonderful way uh, for distraction, your own well-being, expression. And it just, I, I fell in love with the characters and if, yeah, they, they came to life for me. So it was something really enjoyable to do at a difficult time as a professional as well yeah. Um, yeah. with a, yeah. I suppose a, a a large workload and you know people in a lot of um, distress I think so it was really soothing for me as well and and what a good uh, motivation as well to to kind of mm. do something you know you seem like yeah. a very proactive person to just kind of do something like that and to use your creative um mindset and and I suppose those abilities that you have leaned on probably a lot uh, you know as a creative arts therapist we do mm. tend to, to do don't that. we <laughs> yeah Definitely. I uh, think there is something about that as creative arts therapists we're uh, very flexible in the way that whatever situation we can find ourselves in that we will use our intuition our skills to find some way to make it work and to ensure we're doing the best possible job we can it's a uh, hear it from so many uh, creative arts therapists it's so interesting isn't it it's that creativity that we all have so um you know you were you were kind of saying that you were working in in the cams in the nhs and you emailed your dad and i suppose what happened next like so did you did you come back home in that, that october like how did things change for you then no um so interestingly yeah. I, I i sent it off to just to, to Irish publishers and um, it was a, a waiting game I'd say is what I how I would put it um, and you know I guess what after a, I think it was after two months I hadn't heard anything and I saw there was another Irish publisher I found and I sent the book to them and within a I don't know if I should tell the story but within <laughs> within um, a day they got back to me and they wanted the book 
and, and a very good publisher as well. Uh, but there was something about, it's going to sound strange, but there was something about Gil's logo that I really liked, you know, the bee. And I just felt a bit like a busy bee myself. And I always I had this feeling that Gil was the place where I wanted it to go. Yeah. Um, and so when I got an offer, I reapproached Gil and I said, look, I've been offered this. Have you, have you any interest? And um, they said, oh, we'll look into it there. Um, they hadn't actually, because, you know, with lockdown and everyone working from home, submission process was a lot slower. So they hadn't even seen my manuscript, actually. Um, I then get a phone call from the director of Gill, who's Nikki Howard, and she loved the story. And she, she just like, you know, she, she wanted it and she just really felt uh, connected and she used the words love as well. And after speaking with her and kind of reflecting on it, I just felt, yeah, that's, this is the place that it should be. I don't like to use the word should, but I just felt very drawn to, um, I suppose, going with, with Gil. And even in the beginning, I had really just a sense of wanting to, I don't know, have the book published there. So mm. that's how it ended up. And so that was, I think, the 18th of December, just before the Christmas break, which was lovely, lovely news to get for before the holidays. <laughs> yeah. An early Christmas present. <laughs> exactly very much yeah, so yeah that is gorgeous so again just trusting your intuition and just almost feeling mm. a pull towards something so that is just yeah. so lovely um and what a good publishing uh, publisher mm -hmm. because you know they're amazing even Niall Breslin's books are on there so mm. there's a lot already that they have um that leans in on on the kind of coping strategies for children so definitely definitely and um Nas books are amazing as well and it's great that it seems to be um we're getting I suppose there's more awareness coming out there for children and about their you know their well-being their mental health and being communicated in a way that's understandable for them I think that's what's um, really important and so it's really it's wonderful to see that that um that's building I suppose in Ireland as well um absolutely um Okay, so we're going to go back a little bit just so we get a good sense of, of you. So in, in 2016, you graduated as an art therapist. I did. Um, and did you do your training in Cork or where did you do your training? Yeah, so I did my training in the Crawford College of Art and Design, which was fantastic. And I uh, was part of, so I did my master's part-time. So part-time was three year, over three years. Um, but we also had um, colleagues who were full timers, as I, I would say. And as a, you know, as a group, um, actually, we had no males. It was all females. But what an amazing group of women uh, and a very special process to go through. Not always easy. You know, you, you are you're really kind of challenging yourself in that process. Um, but um, I was really privileged to be part of an amazing group of women to be learning with and learning from um yeah gorgeous it is hard I, I did the three years as well did you um and I didn't give myself much of a break because I actually did quite a lot of um work experience because I I was lucky in the way that the people I approached had extra spaces for me so I just took them <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say no to anything so I ended up yeah. doing probably the full-time uh, work experience in two years wow. and then had an extra year just, well done <laughs> but it's just that love and passion for the work mm. and just like that just like not saying no just going no. for it you know exactly and I suppose when you're in a place um you quickly become part of like the team that's there depending on where you are and you know it yeah it's just so enjoyable I completely agree with you I loved uh, where I was on my placements and uh, working with the well adults and children but mm. it, it was fantastic I can see why but still you're amazing <laughs> to have done you know the two years basically and the third so. <laughs> yeah just throw, throw, throwing myself in there I suppose um okay and then you know at the moment then you're working in mm -hmm. Covery Haven in in Kerry yes and tell yeah. me about the work that you're doing now and and how it if if it does still fit into the into the role of creative arts therapist or is it a different mm -hmm. hat that you're wearing currently well i suppose um i guess going into that role part of the reason i 
was so um, I suppose, uh, privileged and lucky to be given the opportunity was because I'm so I'm at the end of a PhD that's um, it's not a clean psych it's PhD but it is looking at psych the psychological well-being of uh, cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy and looking at um, their engagement and their relations with objects such as the um, the sort of the, the clinical cancer space that they were in um, heritage objects and by that I sort of mean a toolkit of museum objects with age value and their own personal objects so looking at the object worlds mm -hmm. and to see how that impacts their well-being as an individual undergoing cancer treatment so I'm hopefully going to be submitting my thesis at the end of this year mm -hmm. touch wood and I and I guess it was my experience um working with so previous to that as well I also worked for children's charity for children who were seriously and terminally ill so that the rainbow trust wow. where there was a lot of therapeutic but also practical supporting parents siblings and the child who was unwell and going to hospital appointments treatment appointments so I think it was that sort of mishmash I guess of experience that brought me to where I am now mm. um and I guess part of the role as a, an assistant manager is it's quite multifaceted and um, you know there's the practical element as well but also so anybody who would come into the center we are starting to open up a lot more uh, which is fantastic and having a lot more face to face which has only come back in the past maybe month and a half two months and part of my role would be to meet with um whether it's uh, family members or the individual who has the cancer diagnosis or somebody who's a friend, you know, a loved one who is, um, I suppose, needing a bit of support and looking for a bit of an olive, olive branch in any shape or form, really, um, because it's such a difficult space to be in, um, dealing with that unknown, mm -hmm. whether you're the individual who has the diagnosis or the, or the, the loved one. And... Um, so I would meet with them and I guess it would it would be it would seem in a way informal, but it's very much me using my therapeutic skills to sort of clinically assess what that individual needs most to support them. And it kind of like a, a creating a, a holistic sort of um, supportive plan for them. So like in the service that we have, I might refer them to one of our counsellors. Or if it's a child, our play therapist, Adele Lawler. Um, we also, I also facilitate along with the my manager, whose background is in nursing oncology, a women's support group, which is every fortnight. And then we have a men's support group, which is facilitated by another um, psychotherapist. Um, we do, I suppose, um, there's a lot of uh, other group work that's happening that is taking place outdoors because we've recently erected um, which was given gifted to us by a um, uh, very kind uh, business, a lovely marquee. So we've been doing sort of movement uh, groups, walking groups, any type of group we can get outside. <laughs> just and I suppose the lovely part about that is hearing feedback from those coming in. It was just to feel that they could come in, have a cup of tea, and meet other people, and have that sense of normal normalcy. Mm -hmm. which has been missing for so so long now for people especially those who've maybe been uh, extra vulnerable because they've been having chemo or immunotherapy you know it's uh, yeah. been hard a hard um, year and a half nearly two years for people I think they I suppose I can imagine feeling that vulnerable and and not wanting to take any risks and mm -hmm. then losing so much social connection um, yeah in the community and with friends yeah that's really definitely that's... and even their treatment you know not being able to sometimes have a loved one come in with them or if they had to stay in hospital being completely isolated except mm. for healthcare staff I mean it's unimaginable really what some people have been through yeah the yeah. loneliness that we've all exactly pushed into and um, mm. that's that that's it and I think yeah that response then of connecting to nature because that I just think that is the cure for loneliness completely you know? I completely agree yeah it's what helped me during the lockdown going out getting to going to the woods that was near me going for a walk being near green <laughs> yes. yeah because we're all part of this we're all connected exactly. to this uh, mm. so it just seems like the most natural response so yeah 
and um, it's beautiful that you you've been able to to have the tent up and to get those groups going again yeah back into definitely nature. gorgeous and the, and the PhD you're doing sounds so fascinating and um, it has been yeah just yeah incredible that you're doing a PhD and <laughs> you've got this beautiful book just being launched now as well it's just wow hats off to you just incredible thanks yeah <laughs> it seems that life is a bit hectic at times but it's mm. definitely worth it um yeah it was a great experience the PhD I was given um well blessed with really it was a scholarship so I'm it's the gift that keeps giving really <laughs> um yeah no yeah it's it sounds so beautiful so um it, yeah so it's a PhD in, in critical heritage and well-being and I just mm-hmm. think marrying those two is just it's just gorgeous yeah thank you yeah um I suppose we've all learned or experienced over lockdown when we didn't have any other sort of social avenues to explore. It was like our natural heritage. Like it's one element of heritage just became so important to everyone, even in the 5K zone, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever we could get. <laughs> Absolutely. Like up the road for me in Maynooth here, there's the folly and, and learning about the, the heritage of that. And, um, uh, you know, even in Blind Boys podcast, he talks about it recently because uh, it's on the grounds of Castletown and uh and how it was just this particular woman's way of of giving to the community you know by giving employment to to people to build something you know yeah it's very interesting but like I would never have taken a massive interest in that even though it's in my 2k (laughs) (laughs) it's literally around the corner yeah um so yeah just connecting to Mm. to the history of where you are the heritage Yeah. yeah it's it's fascinating um Okay, and then I, I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit about, um, I suppose, the real core of, of the book, because without giving it away too much, I, I love that, um, you know, as a creative arts therapist, you've, you've leaned on the, the art mm-hmm. and you were just naturally just painting and, and these characters kept coming to you, which is just gorgeous. But you know, I suppose for anyone who's listening that um, is kind of curious about the book, just as much as as um, the two in, in Chicago, um, like that curiosity, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's, I know for sure, there's a lot of, of parents that are reaching out to me. And even if it's just an email and I get back to them and then they might be a little bit frightened to actually start the process for their kid and, and to... Mm-hmm to seeing an art therapist yeah but this is like a way of of like you said giving an olive branch I know you use it in a different context but it is still something to give back to people that just really need the support but just don't know how to ask and and maybe don't have the financial support there as well Mm. to kind of go and and seek yeah but it it seems like the coping skills that are you know lovely enmeshed in in this book um, could be really helpful for for those who are struggling right now with with the anxieties of returning to that normal uh, yeah. whatever that will look like now but um, and then returning to school will probably be mm. the big one I think so yeah I completely yeah I, I think what I noticed when I last year in CAMS it was then you know uh it was interesting the the different ways anxiety presented so we had like the health anxiety and some kids became really worried about their mom or their dad or even themselves or you know and and they could it could be justifiably so that they someone they love may have uh, passed away and then that sort of triggered sort of this um further kind of health anxiety but also what was really interesting was the social anxiety that came with the return to school so it was sort of like it was a bit like waves I noticed in, um, so when school would stop we noticed that the referrals coming in not so much anxiety they're at home they're not having to do anything <laughs> you know they may it depends what was happening at home um, and what schooling I guess te- schools were providing it was also individual it depends on circumstance parents were trying to be so many things you know at the one time it's uh, an incredibly hard time for parents but what I noticed that so the referrals coming in when they were at home 
you know, we might have had a referral from previous and then we would get in touch with the, pa the parent. The parent would say, well, actually, they haven't been anxious at all since they've been home. It's been it's been great <laughs> in that in that aspect. But as soon as it was schools were back opening, whoa, uh, all that anxiety was so present. It was all the referrals coming in and um, anxiety related to going back to school and being around peers again and school being different as well I can imagine that would have been very scary for children and um, especially younger ones um, so yeah I definitely think maybe as we come a bit closer to the return to school this book would hopefully be quite helpful for parents to sort of read the book together with with their children and see if I guess opening up a dialogue with the child and seeing well what is it, it the child may not be worried at all I don't want to say that every child is and it's so interesting as adults how we can perceive oh they're going to be worried about this whereas they might not it, it might not have occurred to them at all and and we're kind of projecting <laughs> our own worries um but it's just a, an opportunity to give them the space to realize everybody gets worried sometimes there's things that we can try to do about it um and that I'm not alone or I'm not different or strange if I do worry. Um, I think that's really important because so many times I heard from children, you know, I just, you know, my classmates look at me or I'm really conscious that they're looking at me because I'm worried and I feel myself getting anxious or I might have a panic attack. And, you know, there's, it's so hard being a, a child anyway, a teenager and becoming more self-conscious and then worrying about worrying and, it's just, as we know, this sort of vicious sort of circle of anxiety. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think from a young age, if kids sort of have some tools that can help them um, in a real simple way, then hopefully that would be a benefit to them. Definitely. Um, and, and like you said, it's just giving that space. Mm. And if they don't have those worries, yeah. it's just a beautiful story. Exactly. <laughs> you know? It doesn't have to be <laughs> it doesn't have to be psychoeducation. You know, yes. it can be just a story. And that's what I like about it. Um, I think as well. Um people can just read it for a comforting read. It doesn't have to have, you know, the well yeah, it's there, but you don't have to be reading it just for the well being or the the coping skills. Exactly. And I, I love that it's set in autumn and the time that it's now coming to as well. Mm. It just seems like a real preparation for autumn and, and getting into the winter as well. It's just it's such a gorgeous. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a gorgeous setting to, to see in the book as well. Um, and the lovely colours that you've chosen. That's, that's lovely. Thank yeah, you. The palette. Uh, of course, I would be, you know, <laughs> noticing all those kind of things. Of course. <laughs> um yeah so I'm just absolutely thrilled that you came on and had a chat with me oh, thank you and it's been really lovely oh, really enjoyed it um if people were to you know want to look you up where could mm -hmm. they find uh you on, on the internet yeah so I haven't ventured out yet and created a website I'm afraid but um so my Facebook art page sort of acting as an all-rounder of um information and also my um instagram page which is sort of um uh, i guess um a bit of a melting pot of um anything therapeutic and art at the moment mm -hmm. and the book um so those are the two sort of sources on the internet i guess where you can sort of either make contact or um just see what what's happening for me okay. or the book and then I, I checked as well this morning, your book is on Eason. So mm -hmm. there's actually the Irish companies as well there that you can yeah. you can get the book and book depository and Amazon for those mm -hmm. who want international uh, shipping. Yeah. yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to get my hands on an actual copy. I bought it. Oh. <laughs> I bought it, but it's not come yet. But it's the oh. little squirrel who worried. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Katie O'Donoghue, for, for coming oh. on and having a chat. Thank you, Vicky. It's been great. <laughs>